The Southern Alberta Council on Public Affairs acknowledges that we are gathered on the lands of the Blackfoot people of the Canadian Plains, and we pay respect to the Blackfoot people past, present, and future, while recognizing and respecting their cultural heritage, beliefs, and relationship to the land. We offer respect to the Métis and all who have lived on this land and made Lethbridge their home. My name is Violet Mi'kmaq. I will be your moderator today. This is the 57th year of SACPAW, your local volunteer and not-for-profit organization, with our board members working to bring you weekly presentations from local to regional and national current issues. Out of respect for the speakers today, we request that you mute your and turn off your cell phones. We also request there be, there be no photographs uh, taken of our speakers in respect of their wishes. There will be audio recording of this session um, and video of the questioners and myself, but the, our guests uh, are not to be photographed. Our land acknowledgement was shown on the screen prior to our program to remind each of us of our commitment to change. SACPAW is committed to providing relevant topics and speakers. Our session begins now at 12 o'clock noon with a welcome and our speaker at 12.30. The next week's program is announced followed by the Q&A and we will be finishing at 1 o'clock. Although I understand our guests are prepared to stay a little bit longer, people want to talk to them. So, introduction. Our speakers today, uh, was uh, one of our speakers was supposed to be Paul Wirtz from the uh, Wilson Colony. Unfortunately, he's ill, but uh, Henry Wirtz, who is the the uh, German teacher at the colony is here. Miss Clara Wirtz is here with him. Uh, they're from Wilson Siding Hutterite Brethren Colony. As well, uh, we have Jerry Walter from the Lomond Colony who's joining us. And uh, he's the, the historian is going to give you a different, different uh, perspective. Our format will be the panel with the two or with the three speakers talking about their colonies uh, and the history. Mr. Wirtz and Ms. Wirtz have kindly agreed to answer questions asked by Bev and Henning Mundell. We formulated these questions after our visit out to the Wilson Colony on November 5th. Our glimpse into the colony is from photos that Bev and I took, Bev took most of them, during our visit, which Henning has put into a PowerPoint presentation so that you have something to watch and it'll give you a better idea. Please join me in welcoming all of our speakers. Thank you. So as a prelude for the audience, during the Reformation 500 years ago, the Hatterian, Hatterian brethren started when they followed the religious teachings of Jacob Hutter in Tyrol, Austria. And then they fled to escape persecution. And uh, I think, uh, uh, sorry, your first name again? Henry. No, then, uh, Jerry. Jerry, after the, our initial question and answer, he will tell us more about that part. And uh, if any in the audience don't already know about the Wilson Colony, if you look at those two books, it's one book actually, the English translation 1993 for a book that was written in German uh, in 1978 called Das Vergessene Volk by a gentleman who stayed at the Wilson Colony for a year, the forgotten people. I don't think any of you will feel that they are forgotten after today's session, if not already. So I want to ask Henry now and um, but I'll show you first if I figure out, yes, this is where they're located, the map. Um, how and when did the Wilson Siding Colony start? Just briefly, Henry. Henry. Jerry. Jerry. Oh, okay, Jerry's good. The Wilson Colony started in 1918. When we got out, we. It, it started in Canada in 1918, but it was already established in South Dakota. And the World War I, because of persecution, three of our, two of our people died in World War I. And for persecution reasons, we left the United States in 1918 because Canada offered us religious freedom and conscience objector statue 
So we moved up to Wilson, the one colony for Wilson, and got off the train at Wilson Siding and just moved in, pitched up our tent and started building, and here we are. Well, uh, when they came up for, at the Wilson Siding Elevator, it's called PNH. There, that's where the train stopped, and they went off. And one of our neighbors, after everything, she uh, she left as a copy of this. When she, w I'll read it for you. One bright day on June 1918, Tom's sister Susie, who quickly. Sister Susie, who lived a mile from Asfund, come quickly, something's exciting is coming up the road from Wilson Siding. Taking my four-month-old baby long, along and hurried off to see a man with a long white beard and a long black coat walking along supported by staff. Following him were hundred noisy geese, sheep, cattle, driving by the women and children, shouting in German. Those were followed by men driving wagon loads of chicken and ducks, farm implements and household goods. It was a migration of people and Hutterite brethren who had left their homes and farms in South Dakota seeking freedom from military service and persecution for, the, for their religious belief. It reminded me of Abraham living, leaving the great city of Ur Chaldea and with his great flocks, herd and household going to an unknown country in, in search for one God. I felt proud of those new lands of, our, of offering their people a haven. Before buying their land here, their leaders had to visit the government in, in Ottawa, where they were promised that as long as the sun shine and the rivers flow, they would be exempt from military service. One of our neighbors seen this, and he wrote this to us. Yeah. Nice. Thank you. Yeah. Yes. Thank you so much for being here. I'm Bev Mundell Atherstone, one of the questioners. So we'd like to ask a bit about the colony. So how large is the colony and how many people live there? Large as in uh, we have 10,000 acres and we have 130 people at the, living there at the colony. Yes. Thank you. And we, you talked a great deal about self-sufficiency when we went, went to the colony. Um, you stress that the colony has managed to be self-sufficient through diversification. And the next questions that we ask are going to be about the colony itself and um, how it provides for itself and sells products to the southern, to southern Alberta. And I brought along some of the things that um, I got at the colony. These are gloves. They have all kinds of gloves. These are ladies' gloves and um, also insoles made from the fleece of their Murano sheep. So the first question is, what crops are grown? Oh, sorry, Henning. Okay, go ahead about self-sufficient. Yes, being self-efficient on the colony, we have uh, livestock to where we um, grow our own, uh, our own crops and everything, and uh, we do our own furniture and we try and provide our clothing and everything so that we don't have to go buy anything. But down, even if we have to buy something, being self-efficient, we raise our, um, like as, uh, for instance, our milk cows, we sell the milk and we buy some cheese back. But a lot of our, we make cheese too, but we buy some different stuff back with the money that we raise in our crop. And it, but we try and be self-efficient in any way. You know about our food. We slaughter our sheep and cattle, chickens. We have our own eggs, and even well, we'll talk about equipment when we fix that and being self-efficient. Yes, thank you. Yeah. Now about um, the question now is about what what is the range of crops that you're growing, and who do you sell the crops to? And tell us about maintenance repair of your farm equipment. That's what this picture shows. Well, we grow uh, canola, corn, to wheat, barley, 
and uh, peas. And um, we sell it to the local elevators, just next to us, Wilson Siding there, right there, and P &H and H. Um, and then, uh, or equipment, when we, uh, when it breaks down, we have our own shop that we can drive it in there and we fix it up, any breakdowns that we have. We try and be self-efficient in there that we don't have to pay um, hourly to Case or to John Deere. This, but well, they give us lots of support too. They help us out in a way. Thank you. Maybe, maybe you could tell us how a boy goes from finishing school to becoming a welder. <clears throat> well, we only go to, to school till we're in grade nine. And after grade now, nine, <coughs> we, um, when we turn 15, grade nine, we're at 14. And when we turn 15, we go and work on the farm. Our field boss gives, uh, gives the boy a job, a handcraft work and uh, an animal, a livestock work, or on farm, uh, farm work. So, but we feel like our handcraft work that's all he gets, his, uh, that's his life job. When he turns 15 and he becomes a welder, that's what he sticks to it. Because I feel you can't put somebody that's uh, in the leather shop that stretches leather. Metal, you can't stretch it. So you have to find out that as if you're a welder once, you will stay a welder. But as far as livestock, we try and uh, yes, give them no, we try and move them around so they have ev their hands on on every pigs, dairy, feedlot, to chicken barn. So once they're old enough to be responsible as a boss, to be responsible, then the colony can use them as a manager on that uh, Pacific uh, farm there, right at the Enterprise. I just said a little bit. If we see somebody that, that loves like electrician work, mechanics, and has more interest, we would send them to college in the left bridge here. We send people to college to, to bump up their education, get their masters in, in electrician or mechanics. Well, the reason for this, nowadays you can hardly buy anything anymore unless you show your master electrician uh, license. We, we can we can do our own wiring and everything just because of you have to show your and to take out permits that's where we get uh, thank you sorry we passed past you it'll be your turn soon <laughs> okay <laughs> this is the dairy barn the da um, and here I just want to ask uh, Henry, how large your dairy herd is? And aside from the colony needs of milk, do you sell milk? And where do you get the bulls from? We have a dairy herd at, uh, we have 120 uh, cows. We milk them uh, twice a day, but we don't sell any uh, milk, none at all. And uh, oh, where do you get the Okay, we buy our bulls from local bull buyers, or we get them in all the way from Ontario, from different herds. Yes. I think, okay, now it comes, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Look at this. Okay, this is about a question about beef cattle. What beef do you raise, and do you slaughter only your, for your own use, and which do you sell? Do you sell from the slaughterhouse? We don't, we're not in selling any beef, but we do sell in the feedlot we have to the slaughterhouses. We sell this to Cargill or to, yes, we feed them out as fat cattle, as fat steers, but uh, yes. we only slaughter for our own use. What, what breeds? Oh, we do Samatol and Hereford and Black Angus mixed. Yes. Next one I have no slides for, because we just saw the barn from a distance. Poultry, what kinds of poultry to raise? And aside from colony use, what eggs and poultry do you sell and to whom? And we were told that um, after church service on Sunday, everyone has a stuffed duck dinner. So that sounds delicious. We have uh, one kind of poultry 
One is a broiler barn. We sell uh, live shipping to Sunrise Hatchery, no Sunrise uh, Poultry in Lethbridge here. They come in and they take them out live haul, live shipping. And then we have another barn. It's a broiler breeder barn. We sell the fertile egg to Lethbridge Hatchery and they will hatch them. And sometimes we get our own chickens back to the broiler barn, you know, and just to raise food. Yes, and our eggs, we sell the, we sell eggs too, just to local customers that come and buy some. Yes, just the day after we visited the colony, I was here at the uh, bank and I saw a how to ride truck drive up and people unloading eggs and potatoes, so I talked to them. They were uh, from the uh, Kehoe Lake Barrens, which is uh, also a Darius Lloyd, it's an offspring of yours, yeah. right? Yeah. <laughs> okay, um, now we come to leather goods. And uh, we have several slides here. So what is the range of leather goods that your colony makes? Bev showed already the gloves. And um, is the leather from your own cows? And tell us about the Dale Harwood tree that you use for your saddle making. But first I've got the leather here. Yes, we do make, uh, we make gloves and uh, mittens, thicker ones for winter mm, mittens. And um, anything that involves in the cattle business, like shaps or, as far as we make our own shoes too, with leather, that's in a different, okay. Yes, our own shoes there. And um, this is showing you a little bit about, about our being self-efficient, you know, and everything that we don't have to, yes. And we repair our own, and this is the Dale Harwood. But uh, talking about leather, our own cows, this is not our own from our own cows, but uh, our, from our own cows, we do make the rawhide that covers the saddle trees. See, in other farms, when a cow dies, the farmer is sad a little bit because that's his profit. But at our colony, we need the rawhide. When a cow dies, we, you can still use the hide. We take it off and they dry it up while they take off the hair so we can put it on a saddle tree in this one here. But uh, I want to talk a little bit about our saddle trees, Dale Harwood. It was a, it's an, old, uh, an older gentleman. He lives in Idaho Falls. And um, he was old uh, and ready to retire, and he, he couldn't do it anymore. So he wanted to do, take his business and put it in, just let it stand or give it up, you know. So we heard about it, so we went there, and we were interested in going into making saddle trees. So the Dale Harwood saddle tree, um, Dale, Dale Harwood, and by the name of uh, Dale Harwood and Tom Doran and uh, Ray Hunt, they went together to design a saddle tree that fits nice to the horse and comfortable. And they did a lot of researching and it's, uh, now we got to take his job over, you know, and take his business over and do it here. And all the cowboys, they're happy with them, you know. The horse is happy and they're happy. <laughs> now about the um, sheep. Well, this is a question about sheep. It doesn't sound, look like it. But what breeds of, uh, and where do you get the rams? What's the wool used for? And you were once, no, not you. Paul was once a shepherd. And uh, who gets to be a shepherd? And here's the felt making them. <coughs> We have uh, Merino, um, Rambouillet, a sheep, and uh, when we, um, we just started this uh, two years ago, we take our own wool and we send it down to Ontario to get it felted into felts like this for saddle pads. And it's the finest wool, it's actually not meant for uh, saddle pads, it's meant for making clothing, that Merino wool. That's how nice. And the horse, it really, they really like the saddle. And the fit uh, of them blankets that the saddle fits good. And oh, shepherd. who gets to be a shepherd? Like I said, when a young man um, that works under the shepherd, when he's good enough, you know, and he works his way up, as in doing his job right and everything, and when the colony, if the shepherd resigns, and you need a new one, they will most likely take another shepherd that's been working there, you know, and 
with hands on and being, they will tell him to be the boss, to take over. Oh, the insoles, yes. From on, uh, when the company builds the felts for the saddle pads, there's a lot of scrap falling off. And we try and find out good ideas what we can do with the scraps, and this is one of them. Insoles in, in shoes, and uh, like we know, wool absorbs water. It take it pull, and your feet. Uh, you might think they're when they're wet, but they're dry. You know, they're nice and warm during the winter. Now about the woodworking shop. Um, what are some of the wood items that are made? And does every boy get to work in this shop? How are the carpenters determined? So this is the shop, and then here are some of the products. Yes, we make our own. Uh, we, we try and be self-deficient. And uh, as far as making our own furniture, everything we try and do, like our kitchen cabinets, to our tables and chairs, to our bedroom suites, to anything related to wood, we try and do it our own and fix it, you know. That's the biggest thing is fixing stuff. There's always some wood stuff broken. <laughs> so we try and fix, our, fix it our own. And we even do a lot of custom work, you know, when somebody else wants a kitchen or table, and we will take them, like people from Lethbridge sew up, and they ask if we can't build them anything, and we're wo most willing, you know. And, uh, oh, you asked me how do, does a carpenter yeah, be alive? Yeah, yeah. Same thing, yeah. hands on as they go up, they get older, and if the carpenter resigns, the next one goes in. And talking about our brooms, we make our own brooms too, you know, it just, uh, we have an uh, older fella there, working there. We buy the straw from, down from the States, Mexico. from Mexico, it's broom straw. It's oh. special corn broom straw made for, the, uh, for brooms. Okay. From the corn stalks. Thank you. Now a few questions for Clara, for Miss Clara, Miss Clara Wirtz. So, we'd like to know a few questions about how do the young women and young men meet each other for potential marriage? And then after the couple gets married, where do they live? Well, yes, we encourage our young people to see God first and God will show them the way. God will uh, lead them to the right one somehow. There's lots of opportunities. There's weddings and funerals, and we got to visit a lot of people all the time. And when a boy thinks he has found the right one, he goes to the minister of the colony and he tells him what he has on his mind. And if the minister feels this boy is ready to get married, he will kind of, um, the colony will provide a house for him. And he gets to fix up the house and make it ready. And the girl, in the meantime, they have to be baptized before they get married. And once the girl is baptized, she gets a whole bedroom suite of furniture. And she gets to take that along. The girl always moves to the boys' colony. And from the colony, once they get married, they get the whole, like, everything you need for a house. A table and six chairs and a wooden bench. You can even use the bench for a spare bed. And they get a bed and a dresser and a wall clock. And uh, like they get the smaller version, just the smaller version. <laughs> Tells the time too. What's going to say? And that's about it. Thank you, Claire. Now. <clears throat> You were able to have uh, lunch here, but it was uh, nothing compared to the lovely foods that we've had on the colony and um, the wonderful apple pie that we, just, we shared with you there. So um, can you tell us about where the meals are prepared and who prepares the food and how is it decided um, who is going to be cooking? Well, the nice part is the men 
who are the breadwinners out of, of the colony. They don't have to worry about where they will get their next food from. It's all done by the women. So we have one big community kitchen where everybody comes to eat. From 15 and older, they sit in a different dining room. The children, they have a German school teacher and his wife who makes sure their table manage, manners are good before they get to eat with the adults. And the ladies, once they're 17 years old, from 15 to 17, they mostly watch and learn. And on their 17th birthday, that week is their first cook week. So we have three different ladies cooking every week until they're 50 years old, from 17 until they're 50, or, or they get another job. We take turns, but everybody gets a turn at cooking. And there's one head cook who is always in the kitchen. Anything else? Yes, they cook for a week. Every week, three different ladies do the cooking. And it's wonderful food. Okay, now, uh, you mentioned the German teacher, and I think I'll ask this question of Henry. So, are you, the, you and your wife, are you the ones who take care of the younger children under 15? Yes, yes, we are. Um, the question is, how is a German teacher uh, chosen? Is that yes, what, what do you do with the young children? Okay. Oh, um, the German teacher takes over the young children in every way. Most colonies, the German teacher has the garden too. So during the summer, since the German teacher has the children, he takes them right to the garden. We do weeding, we do planting, we then cover, the, the, we look after the garden. We have about a three-acre garden. And um, we, uh, and as far as school, we teach them German. I have a, a supplement to that. A more detail on that, I want to ask you. So when is, here, have a look. <laughs> when is German school taught? And how is the teacher chosen? And do the children speak a different German at school than they speak at home? I know, but I want you to answer. And where do the children learn the church hymns? Now, I just want to tell you, when Bev and I visited there with, um, with the Mi'kmaqs, I couldn't believe so the young kids, a nine-year-old boy, showed me his, his notebook, and that writing looked almost exactly like there, like the one on the right. And this was handwritten. And uh, uh, it says up there, I'm just going to read the first sentence. Bisweilen wird jede Form der deutschen Kurrentschrift als Süderlinschrift bezeichnet. Which means that from time to time, every form of cursive writing is determined, is called Süderlinschrift. But it goes on to explain that it was in use long before the Süderlin even lived. So. On the left here, I have then the Latin alphabet, which we use in English underneath the uh, German handwritten script. So I, I, I didn't want a copy from the children's notebook, but this is what I found on the internet. When is German school taught? When, uh, in the morning after breakfast, we try and get an hour in before English school. We, uh, and the children have verses to, to rehearse. The, um, in the evening, every day they get new verses. They get a song, and we want them to learn that song. And in the evening with the parents, they don't get much, just two verses. And the parents take time to sit down and rehearse them with them. So the next morning when they show up in German school, the first thing, they put the book on the table, and they stand back and rehearse them by heart. Yes, and we teach them to read and write in German. Just for one, the high German. And the Bible, German. the Bible, yes, in high German, like when the way you speak. And then the teacher will have the children all day till 3 o'clock. And then after 3 o'clock, around 2 and 3.30, we have German school again till uh, 4.45, just another hour about. And then they're free to go home, yes. I'm glad you talked about both the German schools and the English schools. Can you tell us who provides the English school teacher? What grades are taught? And I think you've talked a little bit about what children, the students do after grade nine. 
the school division, the, we were part of the school division. Pallister and Horizon, they supply the teacher. And grade six to nine, well, one to nine, yeah. And all they do is teach the curriculum. The faith-based, we, we take care of that, yeah. Okay, I hope you got that, the, the faith-based curriculum. The faith is taught by the, the people on the colony, in particular the German teacher and the pastor. We expect the English teacher to teach us the three R's, reading, writing, and arithmetic. Yes, and that's what we encourage them to do. And Okay, could you, um, this is a question for Clara. Um, Clara, so when do the girls receive their first sewing machine? So when a girl gets baptized, which is around 20 to 25, they have to ask for baptism. That's when they get the whole bedroom suite, the furniture, and their sewing machine. So once they get married, they know how to sew and they, they're ready. They probably start helping to sew when they're 15, maybe 14 already. So they, they probably start sewing in the home with their mom. And I think this was at your house, Claire, the two sewing machines. Yours and your mom? Thank you. Okay, the new, new colonies, can you explain to us, maybe each of you, what happens when a colony gets too big for its resources to be self-sufficient, and how is land found, and how is it determined how you split the colony, and who builds and furnishes the new colony? Well, when you get up to maybe a little over 120 people, or up to 200 sometimes, you decide you you know it, it works best if you if you split about at that uh, at that number. So we start looking for lane, and uh, you know that's that's getting to be a problem. We're branching out into into Saskatchewan. You find a suitable piece of lane, and then you decide these people will go down and just start building. And until everything's ready, it maybe takes four years, five years, six years. And once everything is ready, it varies. Sometimes they volunteer, half of the people move. Sometimes we, we divide the people and put two names into a hat and just pull it out. Whoever gets the yes, moves. Start all over again. Do, Henry, do you want to add to that or Claire? Uh -huh. Well, when we look into Bible times, when, uh, when Jesus came to Peter and he told Peter to take your net out of the left side and throw it into the right side, how, if we look at how many fish they caught, the next morning it was one, five, three. And that number is a good number. To When we're at 140, 150 tree around there, if you split that in half and you split up both colonies, Half, uh, half of them move to one colony, and the colonies will function beautiful. There's companies that took that number and divided their workers into one, five, three, and not a company compared to their company. That's how much success they had. A pen company in Korea or something put that logo one, five, three on their pens. Not a pen company sold as many pens as they did. You know, and they said they took it out of the Bible, you know. And that's... Uh, Okay, um, at the, the, the very last slide is the framed motto that actually Violet took a picture of in um, one of the shops, I think it was the carpentry shop. Bring your life to life, stop planning, start doing. As a unique uh, supporters, as a unique uh, 
weekly opportunity for people to discuss issues. SACPA is supported by many of people in our community. First of all, I'd like to thank the LSCO who provide this room free of charge. Thank you for patronizing their lunch counter. Thank you to the University of Lethbridge for their ongoing support. Thanks to the Herald and other media for their coverage and support. Thanks to Rogers TV for recording our sessions available on TV and SACPA archives. Next week's topic, November 28th, is Richard LaRoche. How important is physical activity for children? Now we go to the Q&A section. And uh, for those wishing to ask questions, we'll ask that you line up over here. As these people are doing against the wall, we ask you be respectful of our speakers. Please state your name clearly, first and last name, because it's being recorded. And your question briefly. No long preludes of stories. We expect respectful, polite discourse. If you prefer to write your question, uh, those legibly written and signed will be asked by me. Okay, uh, make sure you speak right into the microphone. And to start off with, I want to ask a question first, something we didn't, knew we wouldn't ha quite have enough time for. And uh, I'm going to ask this of Mr. Jerry Walter, who kind of came here from the Lamont, or Lamont uh, Lomond Colony. Could you tell us a little bit more, uh, Mr. Walter, about the earlier history of the Hutterite Brethren and how they end up coming to North America? Well, our history starts almost 500 years ago at the Reformation. In 1525, January the 21st, it's going to be 500 years next, next January. You know, if you know a little bit of history, Martin Luther nailed the 95 Thesis on the church door and kicked off the Reformation. Well, we are the radical side of the Reformation. They call us Anabaptists. Because at that date, 500 years ago, in the evening, a few of, uh, in the city of Zurich, Switzerland, Ulrich Zwingel scholars decided, instead of just reforming the existing church, we're going to start our own. And it's going to be not infant baptism, it's going to be adult baptism, believer's baptism. Only people who can be, who believes. So on that day, 1525, is the start of our history. And the Hutterites are a branch of the Anabaptists. We lived in Moravia, modern day Czechoslovakia, for almost 100 years. But through persecution, we got pushed out to Romania. From there, we got pushed out to what is modern-day Ukraine, where all the fighting is going on, and for religious reasons. It was always for religious reasons. And in the Ukraine, in the 1870, the Russian government decided all these German people that Catherine the Great brought in to farm that Ukraine black soil, they have to be Russified. They have to start reading and writing the Russian language and no longer be identified as Germans. So they said, either you do that or you leave. So our people decided to leave. And in 1874, they migrated to South Dakota. Pretty much all of the Hutterites left. We were we took up the Homestead Act in South Dakota till 1918, when the war broke out in 1914. And then they said, we have to join the war. So our elders went to, the, to Washington, D.C. to petition for our young people. And uh, the president said, just go in and do whatever your conscience allows you to do. So we joined the, 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 the camps that trained the soldiers, but we refused to fight. We even refused to wear a uniform and have anything to do with war because we literally believe that Jesus said, turn the other cheek. He said, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom was of this world, I would hire 12 leg legions of soldiers. This is what we believe. That's just the way it is. 
so we refused to fight. And in the process, they didn't treat us very good, you know how it is, and two of our young people died of maltreatment in Fort Leavenworth, Kansas. And the people in South Dakota, the colonists, didn't get treated too well, so we decided to move to Canada. We had already established a colony in Canada in 1898 and had signed that agreement with the Canadian government, like, uh, like was read here, that they would promise us religious freedom and military exemption. And up to this point in time, the, the government has honored it, which we are very, very, very thankful for. And we're very thankful to be a Canadian. And this is where we are. Thank you. Hello, my name is uh, Knut Peterson. Thank you very much for coming to tell us about yourselves. And uh, I'm quite familiar with, I was a potato farmer back in my working days. And uh, related to that, my question to you is, how come you never got into potatoes? You have, <laughs> you have plenty of manpower, uh, adequate land, and I suspect some of the colonies actually rent land out to potato farmers. Why did you never get started? There's all kinds of money to be made in that business. Well, <laughs> and that's a million dollar question. <laughs> the, the colonies in Washington are deep into potatoes. We know that. And we ourselves, a few years ago, was really thinking about going into potatoes. It, but it's a lot of time. And, and not, the work doesn't bother us. But if we take so much time away from, from work, and the spiritual side of it is, is going to be neglected, it's something for us to think about. That's probably the big thing. At least in our point of view. Money isn't everything. Hi, my name is David Major. Uh, thanks very much for your talk. Uh, one thing that occurred to me is you mentioned that the ladies are cooking until they reach the age of 50. And, but I don't, maybe I missed it, but I don't recall you saying anything about what happens once you're over 50. How do you look after the seniors? There's a couple in the room, I think. <laughs> well, the ladies just don't have the full responsibility anymore, but they help, they wash dishes, they cut up vegetables, they do everything else. And a lot of our senior ladies actually take care of the kindergarten, the little ones, the three to six year olds. The seniors help out, they, we could never get by without our grandmas. <laughs> The men never retire. <laughs> they just, whatever, if they can do it, they can do it, you know. Ex except they reach an age where they can't do it anymore. Like, let's say you're the hogman, and you, you figure you, it just, you, maybe you're sick or your health is affecting you, then you retire. But you keep working for as long as you like and you're able. And we want, won't, you know, it takes a whole village to raise up a child. It takes more than mom and dad. It takes grandpa and grandma. My wife, she takes care of the, you know, her, all her relatives, children, men, life. We try and take care of our older folks, like um, even our young, our young people. They will, they will go to their grandpa and grandma, even if, they can, if they're not mobile anymore. Their, their daughters or their, their sons will take care of them. Mostly the ladies will take care of our older. But if they need manpower a little bit, because uh, we haven't got an old folks home or nothing, we do our own. And we take real good care of them. Like as we, if, like as we all know, an old man's wisdom 
Just an old man's shadow is stronger than a young man with a sword. <laughs> so if they're around us, you know, encouraging us to keep going and to keep uh, going the way in the colony and live our life and the way we should, it's a bonus, you know, with them having them. But you know how it is with us, we rely on older folks, older, too much as young guys. Our culture really stresses the importance of respecting the older people. I'm, I'm heading out there. <laughs> Thank you very much for your presentation. Very interesting and very informative. My name is Bob Campbell. I've had some experience dealing with Hutterite colonies over the years. We used to live in Del Benita and we bought our chickens and eggs from the Crystal Springs colony. And we had some really good friends there. I think we could learn a lot from you in terms of your pacifism, not going to war. I think that's a wonderful thing. And I also know that the uh, plasma clinic here in the city would probably not flourish if it wasn't for the donations made by the Hutterite colonies in southern Alberta. So I think we should acknowledge that. Uh, my question is a very quick one. I was involved years ago with a conference uh, for teachers, the secular teachers, English teachers on the colonies, and we brought up a speaker from one of the more radical colonies in uh, North Dakota, uh, well, from Montana, sorry, from Haver, Montana, who was, he had gone on to university and he came and spoke. And he was making a case that sometimes you may need to rethink your attitudes towards higher education. I was happy to hear you say you sent people to the college for advanced training. But I'd like you to comment about your views overall on uh, worldly education or you know, education outside of going up to grade nine. What are your thoughts on that? Well, if education would cause us to lose our culture, you know, you're influenced. Uh, you, there's no doubt about it. You go to college, you're influenced. So we're very careful. If we need a mechanic, fine, that's mechanics. If you need a welder, fine, take the welder course. Go to college for it. But the psychiatrist part, the, the, the socialist education, we're, we're careful. We don't want to lose our culture. If we lose that, we've lost it all. And we don't want to lose our faith that drives the culture. So we're careful. Uh, my name is Graham Greenlee. You mentioned that you uh, repair your own machinery in your, in your own shops. Do you have to go to town to buy parts? Or where do you get parts to, re to repair your own machinery? Oh, yeah. John Deere. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> soft bent, like. Yes. All these dealers in town, we can't, we can't live without them. We buy tractors and combines and trade them off to pickups, sure. Can't, can't do without them. Well, it's, uh, it's nice if, they, if we can't find any more parts, we got a horse and buggies. <laughs> we got one there right now, and it's a beautiful thing, you know. God is a God of order, and when I'm in a German school, and I teach the children how everything should be in order, I tell them, you never see the buggy run through the yard and then the horse behind it. You always see the horse and the buggy. That's... <laughs> Hello, my name is Karen Tui. I've really um, enjoyed your presence here. And um, I think it's wonderful that um, everyone works together to support everyone, feed and work, and um, everyone must have a, a great sense of purpose to, um, to function. But what happens if there's a dispute? What, what happens there? Are there elders that are... Uh, Consulted and... We're only human. <laughs> Sometimes we argue. That's just the way life is. But if we can't settle it among our own colony, we would bring a group of people in, a group of elders or ministers, to help us solve, solve the dispute. It's just like a marriage. 
you can decide how good you're going to get along. It's your, cho it's your choice, you know, for better or for worse. We try to strive for peace, strive for unity. You have to do that every day because we are only human, just like everybody so else. So you bring someone in, uh, in from outside the colony? Yes, if uh -huh. that's what it takes. No, no, no. Oh. No, just from our own Hutterite communities. We would bring somebody in to mediate and try to get to the problem. If it's big issues. If it's big issues, if we can't solve it ourselves, eh? Maybe, Henry, you could talk about what you teach the children in terms of uh, solving disputes. Well, that's, that's where it starts, you know. That's where we have to get them molded a little bit, molded in kindergarten and in German teacher and in German school and in our families amongst houses. You start really young with that. That we have to, if one gives us a hit on the cheek, that we have to turn the other cheek. And that's where it starts, and to encourage them to go back and say sorry and not to give up. That's the most beautiful thing, if we can get them to go back and say sorry. If we have ever experienced that, to going back and saying sorry, then next time we'll be more cautioned that it doesn't happen. So we encourage them that way, and we feel blessed. Yes, like Jerry Fetter said, it doesn't go out of hand that much that we have to get people in. We try and do it amongst ourselves. And that's the three biggest words, is I'm sorry. <laughs> yes, in every way. And it starts in kindergarten. These little guys, when, once they reach three, the age of three, they find out there's more people in the world than themselves, and they have to get along. And it's an interesting fact that Hutterite started kindergarten 250 years before general society, right from the get-go. My name is Mark Gettle. There's an ugly part in our society, and it's called bigotry and racism. And I've witnessed racism against the Hutterites in, Col in uh, Costco when someone was telling them to go back to their colony. It was a very, very sad moment for me. But I think maybe part of that bigotry or racism is also there's a perception in the community by some people that feel that the Hutterite colonies are unfair competition to private industry. So I'd just like you to address that. What do you say to those people? Do they, are you really unfair uh, competition? And also, how much bigotry or racism do you experience? I hope there's not that much. I have ne never actually experienced any in my life. I can't recall once that somebody made a negative remark to me ever. I can't see. And unfair competition, that's an old problem. You know, you... I don't know how to say this. I guess we work together. People think you know, we're working for nothing. We can compete better, but how else should we make a living? We love to farm. We love to do all these things. We have to make a living. We're probably running less land per couple. I'm sure we are than the rest of the farmers around us anyway. And we make a living of these acres as good as we can. That's it. If you take an individual, even if you have a million dollars, if you take the million dollars and divide it amongst 120 people, they're just about broke. Be we'll be short. Yeah, it looks a lot, but there's that many there that have to be supplied. I always think about being a, a financial, no, the, yes, the financial boss in the colony. He goes and buys all the goods for the community, and we divide it amongst the, uh, all of us. So when he drives into Costco and drives down with a wagon, I always feel like I don't, I don't want to be seen. Like people think he's buying them all, but it actually goes home and be, gets divided to, to all of us. You know, that everybody's equal. Okay, this will be the last question. 
Thanks very much. My name is Ian Hurdle. Uh, a little bit of a story. In the past years, uh, some of the Hutterite ladies would have to spend quite a bit of time on the uh, maternity ward because of problems. And they used to tease the nurses that I cook on one week and you guys go home and you have to cook and do the laundry and the housework. I think I have it better than you young nurses. Anyway, I worked up north with a lot of young Hutterite men that had left the colony. And I think there's an expression the Hutterites have from 15 to 21 called the lost years. I know some of them went back and some of them didn't. I don't know if you can comment on the sort of circulation that happens. Yes, we do, abs we do not encourage them to leave, but we're free to leave any time we want to. Nobody has to stay. It's only voluntary. And some guys, you know, these are the critical years, 15 to 20. You, you know how it is. Sometimes you think that the, the grass is green on the other side of the fence. They have to try, and try they do. But most of the time they get back, they come back. Thank you so, thank you so much, um, Carol Darmody. I went to Wilson Siding in the 19, early 1980s with Gordon Campbell, the, one of the founders of this organization, and it was an invaluable experience. I've been back several times over the decades, seen changes, but I want to thank you for opening the colony to outsiders because it was very valuable. Thanks. Thank you. My name is <coughs> Klaus Jericho. A very quick question. When you first came over 100 years ago, I, went, I don't know, how, maybe 100 people came? I think there were about seven colonies. Oh, came at the time. Yeah. Okay, how many colonies do we have in Canada now? And what is the uh, Hutterite population? 654. Uh, <coughs> All the colonies, there is like... 600, 654. In, that's in Canada or in... All over, all the colonies. All that are, there is like... Manitoba, South Dakota, Washington, uh, Minnesota, all over North America, Saskatchewan. 640 col colonies. Yeah, yeah. So do, it's so about 50,000 people, give or take a few. No. There was, but <coughs> it kind of, it kind, they kind of gave up. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Henry, could you mention about the three different kinds of colonies? There's Lara Light, Darius Light, and Shmeen Light. Share about a little bit how we get there from... Well, when we moved over from the Ukraine to South Dakota, it seems like they, they, they split up in these three groups. I don't know all the details, but the one leader was called Darius. So all his followers, we call him Darius Lloyd. Lloyd means people. Darius Walter. Darius Walter. I'm a Walter. And uh, we call him Darius Lloyd because the, the, the term Lloyd means people in German. So the Darius people. The second leader was uh, worked in the blacksmith. And in German, it's called Schmied. Schmied. So they got the name of Schmied Lloyd. The third fellow was a teacher. He actually went to university in, in Russia for, for a teacher. And the word in German for teacher is Lehr, Lehrer. So we call them Lehrer Lloyd. Mm -hmm. But we can, we've got nothing. We're all the same faith. We can intermarry and everything. Yeah. We're all the same faith, we can intermarry, we can move from one colony to the next. But the men don't move. Just the women. 
the girls. Hey, thank you. Um, before we, uh, we have a special treat for you in a minute here to close. But before that, I'd just like to ask one thing that we haven't really covered, um, our questioner Carol mentioned about going out to the colony. Um, so are people here welcome to come out to visit? Do they have to contact you first? And uh, what kind of things could they, could they purchase if they're interested in coming out? Because I think you have a lot of things that you, you sell to people on the colony. Could you answer that? Well, you're most welcome anytime. You know, on Friday afternoons or whenever it's time, even in more during the week, they just ask for whatever you want. If you, we sell shoes to mittens to gloves to them woolly sole insoles, and then vegetables and buns uh, to um, I don't know them groceries. Potatoes, carrots, uh, potatoes, <laughs> yes, <laughs> we actually, see, that's another thing, we really feel like the children that aren't 15 yet, we try and give them a responsibility, and the gardener, we have about three acres of potatoes, and we have a root cellar, where we bag potatoes for the grocery stores here, for Safeway, east and west, on the west side, and we have old folks home that we supply potatoes to, bulk. They buy them Garden View, Lodge, and uh, Black Rock. Yes, and we supply them too. With, uh, and the boys, before they're 15, they got a big responsibility there. We have them working in that. And that's where they can start already, from being responsible for the community. So when they turn 15, they're ready to go. They got their responsibility already when they were 12, 13, 14. Work addicts. Yes. Thank you. Now, we have uh, four young women here today. Besides Clara, we have Lisa, Helen, and Susan. And I'd like to ask them to come up because I think they have something special for you. Do you want to come up to the front? Yeah, without the... Should I do it in one of this Yeah. One?
thank you very much. All right, we thank our, our presenters and our questioners and these young women, and it was a wonderful program. Thank you.